let's start off with SVAs in cardiology. So um, I'm an internal medicine trainee at St. George's Hospital, some of you will know. Um, I'm not a cardiologist, so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to talk about the cardiology as it relates to general medicine and the stuff that I've picked up as a medical trainee, which is pretty much what you would probably need to know as a medical student and a junior doctor, um, and also some more obscure things that may be related to MRCP sometimes. That's sort of the, the, the end of the knowledge I'm going to give, because I think there's a lot of really difficult cardiac physiology, which I'm not really going to get into because I'm not confident with as a non-cardiologist. So I'll tell you when this is like medical school stuff, junior doctor stuff, and then really at the end of the line is going to be sort of initial MRCP stuff. But I don't think you need to focus on that too much. So we'll try and keep to the core things. Um, so the core stuff, ACS, um, congestive cardiac failure, infective endocarditis, uh, and things relating to valves and um, the uh, arrhythmias. So really the, the, the way I think about cardiology is that you can divide it into uh, the muscle, um, and that can be things like ACS, the valves and certain valvular lesions, and then the electricity. So arrhythmias and things like that. So that's sort of my understanding of how things work. And hopefully um, that will sort of guide our session going forward. And, and if you have any questions, you can put them on the Q&A and then we can hopefully answer them. And if I don't know the answer, I will find out and I'll put it on our Facebook group as well, as I put some additional stuff in our previous lecture as well. And this lecture is going to be recorded and it's on YouTube. I think it's recorded, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I hope it is. Um, I'll check if it is when we start our first question. And then we will crack on. So thanks very much for coming. Cool. So I'll give you a minute and a bit to go to join this, to have a look at this question. So give you another 10 more seconds, please. Thank you. Uh, and then we put your final answers, please. So a lot of people are messaging. So I'm just adding them onto the uh, panel. Cool. So I think 66% of you have gone for B. Uh, fine. So I message people who are coming in. So welcome to those who are joining. Brilliant. So the answer here is unstable angina. So looking at the answer, we have a 56 year old who's come in with crushing chest pain for the past 60 minutes being at rest. At rest. So the key with this is that you're thinking about whether or not it's at rest or it's not at rest because um, at, if, it's at, if someone is doing it on exertion, that's more likely to be something like stable angina, which is not sort of an emergency in itself. So that's why D is incorrect. Um, the pain improves when the ambulance paramedic gives him GTN spray, and then there's some T-wave inversion in these leads, but the troponin is normal. So really, this question is trying to elicit the differences between different types of acute coronary syndrome, and the key differentiations are whether or not there's evidence of cardiac damage, which essentially is re represented by the troponin measurements, um, which in this case is normal. So if, it, if there's no change in troponin, um, then it is unlikely to be a myocardial infarction, um, but also the it's not an ST elevation MI because there isn't any evidence of ST elevation here. So therefore, A is incorrect. It's not a non-ST elevation MI because the troponin is normal, and it's unlikely to be a myocarditis because you may expect other things like having a fever, uh, prolonged chest pain. You may have some risk factors as well, but it doesn't really fit. So in this particular scenario, you have pain at rest. That makes it unstable. There is ECG changes, and there is no cardiac damage per se as represented by the troponin. So um, what we'll do is we'll go to another question, and then we'll talk about acute coronary syndrome in a bit more detail. So uh, cool. So thanks, everyone, for joining. Who's new? So we'll give you another minute to go through. <laughs> 
Right, so another uh, 10 more seconds to go through. This is a harder question, by the way, so don't worry if you're struggling. Right, so uh, give us your answers, please. I think we'll finish up now. Uh, what, oh, sorry. Yeah, fine. So 45% uh, have gone for A, cool, and then 25% have gone for B, brilliant. So the answer here is, Oh, sorry, sorry, my bad. Uh, this is, uh, I've changed the, the question slightly. So the answer is in fact, um, so this says papillary muscle, which is incorrect. The answer is actually interventricular septum. I've just changed it towards the end. I tried to make it slightly easier. So the, the reason why papillary muscle is incorrect is because you would not expect some of the features that uh, are in this particular scenario. So uh, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. So 62-year-old who has a myocardial infarction, he comes in with shortness of breath and malaise, and there is a palpable parasternal th thrill and a harsh pan-systolic murmur along the left sternal border radiating towards the apex. And there is a... a the JVP of three centimeters above the normal level, and there's a bipedal pitting edema. So that question is asking you which of the following lesion sites is consistent with the most likely diagnosis. Let's just go through the other ones just so that you can um, figure out why the other ones are incorrect. So the reason B is incorrect is because if you have a rupture of the left ventricular free wall, it essentially come, you come with acute heart failure, but also you get signs of cardiac tamponade. So you're really, really unwell in that scenario, and this patient doesn't look like it although there are some signs on, on examination, which I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, the pericardium is incorrect because uh, the um, post, this is a post-ACS pericarditis, some of you will find out, Dressler syndrome, that tends to present two to six weeks after the acute event with chest pain and fever. Um, and then the um, cardiac conduction system is incorrect because that essentially sometimes leads to damage to the atrioventricular node, and what you might get instead is a um, sinus bradycardia, first degree heartbreak, or any or, or type one second degree heartbreak. So um, the reason, so if we look at the question itself, it's telling you that there is a palpable parasternal thrill and a harsh pansystolic murmur along the left sternal border. So the, um, this is sort of indicating that there's a new murmur, which is, um, and that can be related to different areas of the heart being affected. So the answer here is actually that you have someone who has a ventricular septal defect, um, secondary to uh, heart, um, uh, secondary to this heart attack, and that's why the intraventricular septum is correct. So the other option here is because we have a pansystolic murmur, it could be acute um, mitral regurgitation. So that's why if we go back, so I, I changed it to make it slightly easier basically, but I didn't change the initial one. So papillary muscle is also um, related to acute mitral regurgitation. Um, and that could also be a pansystolic murmur. The reason why it is more likely to be intraventricular septum is because you wouldn't expect such a harsh pansystolic murmur in mitral regurgitation. And also you would expect more left-sided heart failure. So the JVP is not too bad um, and there's more sort of right-sided heart failure with the VSD in itself. But uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I think the key point here in this question was just to sort of remind you of some of the complications of um, heart failure of uh, myocardial infarction, try to make it a bit easier um, as the distinction between acute mitral regurgitation and also uh, the uh, ventricular septal defect. I think it can be a bit difficult to distinguish and I think it may be a bit too hard for, uh, for you at this stage in your career. But uh, let's um, move on. We'll talk about it in a bit more detail. And then if you have any questions, you can ask them as well. Cool. Um, so just before we talk about the... Um, we talk about the uh, ACS. Um, so I guess if people want to put in the chat what they think the lesion is in this scenario, just so we can uh, we can familiarize ourselves to where things are. So we can see that there are some changes in maybe V2, V3, and V4. So we have sort of this ST elevation. So we're more thinking that it is likely to be an anterior lesion. 
Um, so there is also some lateral stuff on the V5 as well, maybe not so much in V6. So possibly we could say this is anterior lateral, for example, could be the LAD, um, so the left anterior descending. So we will talk about this in more detail as we go through our notes. Cool. So acute coronary syndrome is a spectrum of disorders. And as we saw in our initial question, we have a spectrum ranging from uh, unstable angina all up the way until we get to the ST elevation MI. With unstable angina, you have chest pain, you have a normal or an abnormal ECG, but the key is you have normal troponin. With an NSTEMI, you can have any ECG changes apart from a ST elevation with a raised troponin. And finally, with a STEMI uh, or ST elevation MI, you essentially need to have persistent ST elevation or new left bundle branch block. In most cases, you won't really need to do a troponin because um, in the, especially in the sort of PCI setting, you sort of would just crack on and go ahead and do your PCI straight away if someone is acutely unwell. Um, so in, in most scenarios, you won't do a troponin. But if you're on the ward, for example, and you see someone with ST elevation MI, you probably would want to do a troponin as well. Um, and there are certain uh, ECG changes. So in the... Um, Chest leads is one millimeter ST elevation, and the limb leads is two millimeter, and also left bundle branch block. And the key for the end STEMI as well is that it's non ST elevation and the troponin is raised. Um, the only other thing I would mention about the troponin is that it is a cardiac marker that indicates cardiac damage, and um, it can be raised in so many things. So it can be raised in renal failure, for example, um, uh, chronic kidney disease. It can be raised in lots of other cardiac pathology. So if someone has atrial fibrillation, you may also have some cardiac damage alongside that and therefore you will have a raised troponin as well. So sometimes it can be quite difficult to distinguish between raised troponin of different causes and that's why you need to do different troponins at different times um, because you want to see if it, there's a dynamic change or an acute change. So therefore if someone's got chest pain you do a troponin first off and then you do another troponin about three to six hours to see if there's a change. And if there is a definite change uh, or it's, it's going up, then it's much more likely to be an STL, uh, or sorry, uh, to be a, uh, an NSTEMI or a STEMI. So, cool. So with regards to our location of our, uh, of our lesions, let's say, so this is um, just a quick understanding. Some of you will have come across. So two, three in AVF, so you can see two, three in AVF here, that is um, inferior, that could be the RCA. The V1 and 2, as we saw here, that could be septal, it could be proximal lad. If it's anterior, it could be 3 to 4. But also, if it's a left anterior descending, it could be V1 to V4 as well. So that's the sort of anterior side of the heart. The V5 to V6 is more of the lateral side of the heart. And then there is a more obscure uh, version, which is when you have ST depression in uh, the V1 to 3, that it is more likely to be a posterior MI. Um, so the idea really is that it sort of inverts um, and you a ST elevation MI um, in the posterior leads will show up as ST depression in V1 to 3. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it works in electrophysiologically, but this is the sort of categories that I have remembered as a medical student and as a junior doctor. So these are all on our notes as well, so you can have a look at them later if you wanted to read through in more detail. Um, in terms of the management of ST elevation MI, um, the key is to make sure to resuscitate them appropriately with the um, ABCD assessment. And equally, um, you don't need to give oxygen unless their saturations are low. Uh, so your aim really for SATs are more than 94%. You would load them on aspirin, 300 milligrams. And in a lot of cases, um, in some hospitals, you would want to load them on a second agent, such as clopidogrel or tocairolor. This will depend on your hospital policy. Um, the, um, you, if they are in a lot of pain, you could give them GTN spray. If they're in loads of pain, you can actually give them GTN infusions, um, but that tends to be sort of a more senior decision. Um, and then you would give IV morphine, dimorphine, and that also helps with the pain as well. So the STEMI, I guess STEMI is like a very acute emergency where in most cases, if the patient is fit enough, uh, you would want to go for very acute, um, management via a PCI, so percutaneous coronary intervention, trying to put a stent in, for example. Um, and then you would want to do it within 12 hours of onset of pain, and if they're in less than two hours since first medical contact. So that's the sort of time frame that you try to, to go for with the idea that time is myocardium, and therefore you try to minimize any damage to the heart and try and open up the blood vessels and the arteries as soon as you can.
Um, as opposed to STEMI, the end STEMI is slightly different in the sense that there isn't that sort of time urgency, you know, within two hours you try and sort out their angio angiography. Um, you would still do the same sort of stuff. So oxygen if needed, um, aspirin, clopidogrel, tachycagalor, GTN spray, morphine, diamorphine. The other extra thing I suppose you would give is you would give some antithrombin therapy, and that could be either low molecular weight heparin or fondoparnix, which work in similar ways. And then the difference is that with an NSTEMI, you would maybe do the angiogram within 96 hours. Um, it sort of depends on how high risk they are. So what the cardiologists tend to do, from my own experience, is that they calculate certain scores, such as the GRACE score, and they try and estimate their risk of mortality um, based on their symptoms, based on their um, risk factors in the past, and then therefore they will then triage how quickly someone needs to have an angiogram, and it often means that they have to stay in hospital for a day or two until that gets sorted out, as obviously there is a higher, uh, there's loads of angiograms that need to be done, but as a medical doctor, we end up just looking after these patients for a day or two until they're stable, and then they have their angiogram, and then they either have a stent or not, depending on what they need. So that's a sort of a whistle through how we manage SC and N, and N STEMI MI. Cool. Um, so long-term management is very important. So you will be asked a lot about this in vivas. Uh, so smoking cessation, lipid modification, treating diabetes is very important. And there are certain medications you would want to start. Uh, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers are very important, and equally dual antiplatelet therapy. Usually aspirin, you keep going on for life, but you can give to Kegrelor for 12 months. Um, and it's a bit tricky because some you know, some people may have other medical problems. So like they may need to um, go for an endoscopy, for example, or colonoscopy. And the question is, oh, should we stop there to Kegrelor because we're going to do a biopsy, for example. And the answer usually, it's we have to discuss with the cardiologist on the most part, but a lot of it is related to uh, if they've had a stent or not, because sometimes you need to have these antiplatelets on if you have a stent, because then the stent can actually thrombose. So it's really important to just not stop antiplatelet therapy in patients who have had heart attacks or have had stents, um, especially in the first year after they have it. So it's always important to discuss with your friendly cardiologist um, to see whether or not we should stop them or not. Um, the other thing that comes up in single best answer questions a lot is about driving. So the key is that if you've had an angioplasty or a stent, you shouldn't, you are actually allowed to drive for a week. So you're not allowed to drive for one week and then afterwards you can. But if you've not been treated with a stent, then you're not allowed to drive for one month. So that's the sort of distinction that they have. But you don't need to contact the DBLA. You just sort of do it on your own accord. But if you have any problems going forward, then you should contact the DBLA. Um, cool. So complications of myocardial infarction we talked about. Um, so again, it, it, again, the way I think about it is you have the electricity, so ventricular arrhythmias, for example. You have valves with acute mitral regurgitation. Um, and then the, um, you also have the, what was the muscle as well. So you can have things like recurrent ischemia, you can get shock. Um, and I suppose you can also get other things like tamponade, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. Um, the, um, it's quite important because they all present in different ways. So with arrhythmias, they could have a tachycardia or a bradycardia, could have more chest pain, for example. So, and also it's important to make sure to examine your patients if they have any myocardial infarction in the past. So checking if they have any new murmurs, doing an ECG, for example, and making sure that they're hemodynamically stable. For example, in tamponade, they could have very low blood pressure. Um, so the way I remember it, which is a mnemonic someone told me many years ago, is um, Death Passing Parade Street. Uh, and I discovered that Parade Street is actually a street right next to St. Mary's Hospital. So that makes me think that actually there was someone at Imperial who made it. Uh, but it looks like quite a nice street, lots going on. You've got KFC, you've got a Malaysian place, which is cool. Um, and then uh, Death Passing Parade Street, death, pump failure, pericarditis, rupture, arrhythmia, embolism, dresslers and ventricular septal defect. So um, those are the ones that I remember a lot. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully it's a useful mnemonic. And this is on the notes as well, if you want to access it later on. Cool. So let's look at the next question.
So last 10 seconds, please, answer to uh, put your answer in. Cool. Uh, so, fine. So we got 64% have gone for E, and then some people have gone for C. Cool. So um, the answer is E. So cool. Uh, so you've got someone who's got chest pressure um, occurring after climbing a flight of stairs. So he's got stable angina, you would think, in this scenario. So he has uh, pain on exertion, which is equivalent to angina. So it's not an acute coronary syndrome, going back to what we were learning earlier. Um, he's got loads of risk factors, not really helping with GTN spray. And then he has an angiogram. It's got significant three vessel stenosis, which of the following is the most appropriate management step. So this is sort of one of those things that you can actually know in terms of your, your very deep understanding of, of cardiac guidelines. Um, but also it's sort of an, um, something that does come up in single best answer questions as a like clue. And basically three vessel stenosis is something like a, uh, should be a bright spark for you that says three vessel stenosis, cabbage, that, or, or coronary artery bypass graft. And that's why it's the correct answer. And I'll talk about the guidelines in a bit more detail. So just looking at the other stuff. So transcontaneous electrical nerve simulation, not very useful in this scenario. Wouldn't really deal with the three vessel stenosis. Uh, B and D are treatments for angina, so stable angina. Um, but in this scenario, you know, you have something that you could probably fix. So it's probably not the right answer. And then you, it's difficult to revascularize with PCI um, in the sense that you, there's three vessels. I suppose you could in theory, but I think that there is some evidence that cabbage is better than PCI, especially if you have like loads of stenosis going on um, in three different vessels. But let's talk about the guidelines. I think are on the next slide. Yeah. So the indications for PCI, we essentially talked about most of them. So you have this um, ST elevation, end STEMI, unstable angina and stable angina. So in that scenario, we saw stable angina. Um, and then um, if you have someone with high risk uh, stress test findings as well. But I think really for this question, what I wanted to talk about in more detail was the cabbage. And uh, so this coronary artery bypass graft. So you're essentially trying to bypass areas of stenosis. And they, these are sort of three indications. So 50% left main carotid artery stenosis, 70% of the proximal lads and proximal circumflex, and then three vessel disease in asymptomatic patients or those with mild or stable angina. Um, uh, it's just something that sort of does come up in exams a lot, and it's useful for you to have an understanding of what the indications are for cabbage. Um, so the coronary artery bypass graft, you essentially take a vein from the uh, legs and you put it into the heart and you bypass the stenosis. So in patients who you are examining on the wards, always, always, when you're starting your cardiovascular examination, this is useful for your MRCP going forward if you want to do MRCP, but also for your OSCEs and finals, is that you will need to always make sure to look at the legs for any scars on the legs, and then also look for any scars in the abdomen, in the chest, which may indicate that they have had a cabbage. The only other thing I would add is that in some patients who have valvular disease, they could also have a cabbage alongside a valvular operation. So therefore, when you are listening to the patient's heart, always make sure to listen out for um, valve issues, even though it looks obvious that they've had a, a cabbage because they could have both operations. So that's something people get caught out on. They see this uh, vein that they see the scar on the leg and they're like, oh yeah, definitely cabbage. But actually, you could have a lot of things going on. Uh, cool. So let's move on to the next question. So yeah, last few seconds, please. So last 
five seconds, 10 seconds. So yeah, put your last question answers in. Thank you very much. Cool. So 49% uh, have gone for bilateral blunting of the costophrenic angle, which is the correct answer here. So let's look at the uh, choices here. So you've got a 60 year old male, 33 month history of shortness of breath. Um, he's got lots of risk factors. So that's sort of the key thing with cardiology is that you always just say, do they, do they have risk factors or they don't? They do. Moving, moving on, basically, because most people who have this, these risk factors will have a number of them together. So in this particular scenario, diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. So when you're speaking to a cardiology registrar, as I discovered in my F1 years, always start off with saying they've got loads of risk factors, if they do. So the uh, JVP is three centimeters, bibasal fine crackles, and there's pitting edema, and you're looking at x-ray findings here. Um, so... Let's look at the other answers. So water bottle shaped enlarged cardiac silhouette. Um, so you do have cardiomegaly um, in heart failure, which this is the most likely cause. So the JVP is raised, there's fine crackles, there's pitting edema, most likely to be heart failure. Um, water bottle shaped is more likely something like a tamponade or, or, a, or a essentially that it just sort of shape changes the shape of the heart in itself. The cardiothoracic ratio, you'd expect it to be uh, more than 0.5 because it is larger than the thorax. Uh, lower lobe blood diversion is incorrect. It's more likely to be upper lobe diversion. And then the prominent central pulmonary artery um, is more consistent with pulmonary hypertension, uh, which can be secondary to lung disease rather than uh, heart disease uh, or heart failure in itself. So therefore, it's not the correct answer. And we only have bilateral blunting of the costophrenic angles being the, uh, the correct answer. So. Um, Let's, we'll talk about the x-ray findings and heart failure in a bit more detail. Let's go to another question and then we'll, we'll wrap it all together with heart failure. So 10 more seconds, please. Answers in, yeah, cool. So, most people got four, so it's a bit of a spread actually. So, you got C and E 24%, 24%, um, and then B is 34%. Cool. So, this is a harder question because I wanted to illustrate a few points. So, don't worry if you got this wrong. Um, it's it, I, I really wanted to use it as a learning point to to so be a springboard for few, for discussion going forward. So Really don't worry if you got this wrong. This is a, is a difficult question. So the answer here is C, um, left ventricular ejection fraction of 60% and normal diastolic filling patterns. So before I talk about this, I just wanted to make it clear that you the, the normal left ventricular ejection fraction is six, about 65%. So in this, 60, 65%. So in this particular scenario, that is normal. So just keep that in mind um, so that you know in future what is a normal ejection fraction. So you have someone who has fatigue, shortness of breath, weight loss, anxious and irritable. Okay, weird. Um, the tachycardic and there is a non-tender midline neck swelling. So then the, in this case, without even reading the rest, you're just like, oh, this is really weird. Like what, this, what could this be? Because um, this sounds like hyperthyroidism in a way, doesn't it? Because you're anxious, irritable, tachycardic, neck swelling so you're thinking okay hyperthyroidism but then also you've got this raised jvp sorry the jvp is raised and then you have pitting edema to the mid shin so you're thinking oh okay is there um is there 
heart failure, for example? Could this be heart failure? Um, so this idea that basically is that we're, what we're getting at is that you're mixing in hyperthyroidism and heart failure. What could this be? What could the possible uh, answer be? And what this question is really getting at is this concept of high output heart failure when you have um, essentially a normal echocardiogram, which is what is here. So you have normal uh, left ventricular ejection fraction and a normal diastolic filling patterns. The idea is that you have a normal um, echocardiogram and then uh, and that could be relating to high output because the, your body is not actually getting enough oxygen. You're working very, very hard, but actually there's nothing wrong with your heart. And that can be related to a number of conditions, which I will talk about in a bit more detail. So the key learning points from here is that the ejection fraction, a normal ejection fraction is about 60, 65%. Um, and then the other thing is that um, the a cause of high output heart failure is hyperthyroidism, but there are a few others which I'll talk about in a bit more detail shortly. Cool, and the midline swelling, someone's asking, that is more likely to be like a goiter, basically. Um, so that is going along with this hyperthyroidism. Uh, cool. So if we talk about heart failure, you can divide them into um, systolic, uh, diastolic, um, and that is high output. Um, and really it's sort of your ability of your heart to move around blood. Um, and it is, it, it can be related to lots of uh, other cardiac conditions. So we can see here uh, ischemic heart disease, dilated cardiomyopathies, myocarditis as a source of systolic heart failure, where you have an inability to push blood out. But also you went with diastolic heart failure, it's sort of this relation to the stability of your heart to relax. And that can be really, and that can also affect your cardiac output going forward. And that can be related to things like HOCOM, so hyperobstructive cardiac myopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, cardiac tamponade. Those are the sort of things that are more likely to cause a diastolic dysfunction. And then high output heart failure, I will just leave for a second and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. So you can uh, distinguish in, in high output heart, in, in heart failure in the severity by the New York Heart Association classification. And that tends to tell you about how a significant their short 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 of how significantly short of breath they are. So the more short of breath they are on the on less activity, the more they are severe in terms of heart failure. And the tests you would do in heart failure are uh, ECGs, of course. You want to see if there's any ischemia. BNP is a very useful test because it tells you whether or not there's evidence of uh, release of this uh, brain near. near natriuretic peptide, which is a sign of cardiac damage as well. And it is very much associated with heart failure. And you tend to do it in the GP setting, for example. So before you do an echocardiogram, you do a BNP first. If it's raised, you would then go on and do an echocardiogram. Your urea and electrolytes are very important in heart failure because you want it to, a lot of times you may give things like frusamide, which is a diuretic, which can affect the renal function. So therefore you wanna make sure that it is uh, looked after and monitored appropriately. And finally, glucose is important. Um, this is sort of a new thing that people are thinking more about the relationship between glucose and heart failure. There has been a big, big trial recently, the DAPA heart failure trial in, Ed, in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019. They showed that uh, starting someone on a medication called DAPA, dapagliflozin, uh, which is a, uh, I think it's an SGLT1 inhibitor, is associated with improved outcomes in heart failure. So I think now we're really appreciating the relationship between heart failure and glucose management. And, and that's something that in the next few years, I think will be very important. Um, conservative management in the certain sense of salt and fluid restriction, uh, you're trying to reduce the amount of fluid that's going into the heart, uh, that is, is uh, filling into the body because that can cause a lot of uh, disruption and fluid going everywhere. And medically, you would treat with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, that improves mortality. Frusamide um, is symptomatic, um, and then it, it sort of treats your, your symptoms more than, it doesn't actually have a much effect on your mortality. And then spironolactone, also it improves mortality as well, you can give that later on. Um, interventions, you can do lots of interventions such as cardiac synchronization or putting in a, a, a defibrillator. Um, and that is something that is very, very specialist. So I don't know that much about, but I know that it's something that you would consider later on. Uh, and so and when, if you're in a viva and someone's asking about heart failure, you would always say, oh, I treat conservatively with salt and fluid restriction. Medical treatment thereafter would be this, this, and this. And then finally, surgical interventional treatments would be cardiac synchronization, for example. So that's the sort of thought process I would have when you're answering vivas. Um, 
when you're looking at the uh, heart in itself, so you can get alveolar edema, uh, which is um, this sort of A, B, C, D, E uh, mnemonic, um, looking at the uh, interstitial uh, lungs and whether or not there's any evidence of shadowing there. You can get curly B lines, which is evidence of fluid in the small fissures. You can get uh, cardiomegaly, as we talked about earlier. So upper lobe diversion is when you have the evidence, you, because the, the, um, because you can see in the actual chest x-ray, you can actually see the arteries in the top of the heart, and that is upper lobe diversion, and that indicates that there's lots of fluid going in there. You can see pleural effusions, where you can see blunting of the costophrenic angle, and you can also see um, fluid in the horizontal fissure, which is usually on the right-hand side. So uh, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail on Tuesday with our radiology registrar, uh, Nishanta, who's going to go through in a bit more detail about how to interpret x-rays. So I won't go through this in more detail just yet. So cool. Um, so we were talking about high output heart failure earlier. So this is a mnemonic that I use, so AAPPTT. And basically, it's this idea that you have heart failure where you are, um, where your heart is actually fine, but it's actually the fact that you don't have enough oxygenation for different reasons, and therefore your heart's your heart's working quite fast, and therefore you can decompensate yourself. Um, a lot of this is a lot of this for exams, I suppose. So you know things like Paget's disease, thyrotoxicosis, you know thiamine deficiency, wet beriberi. It's not really very common in real life. I've not seen it. I suppose the only thing that I've seen is probably anemia and myself. And anemia is a cause of high output heart failure. And it's basically this idea that like, if you have someone who's got heart failure, for example, and they also have anemia, it's quite a good idea to optimize them and make sure that their anemia is settled because that will allow them to settle other parts of the body and you can focus on other things. So basically, the, the, so you would try and sort of consider transfusion, for example, um, and you would try and make sure that they are stable. Um, the rest is, is mainly for reference. I suppose the other, only other thing is pregnancy as well. You can get high upper heart failure and people sort of struggle a bit with breathing as they get pregnant. But actually, pregnancy is a bit of a minefield in the sense that lots of patients who are short of breath um, uh, who are pregnant can be quite a wide variety of things. So it could be they could have a pulmonary embolism, for example. It could be just the fact that they're carrying more weight. So it's quite a difficult uh, concept, uh, this issue of pregnancy and shortness of breath. But just generally remember that high output heart, heart failure, normal echocardiogram, these are the causes and anemia is the most common in real life, but just a good sort of reference point for you. Um, Managing patients with acute pulmonary edema, um, it can be um, difficult because patients are very unwell sometimes. Um, so you would give them oxygen uh, if they need it. You give them diuretics. So usually we would give something like 80 milligrams of frusamide IV to try and um, kind of vasodilate them, get them to, to pee out all their, uh, all their fluid. Um, nitrates as well can help with uh, venodilation as well. So that can help with acute pulmonary edema. Morphine as well. And if that doesn't work, you would consider things like CPAP, um, continuous positive airway pressure, uh, nitrate infusions, and then inotropes if things are really bad and you need to push up the blood pressure. And once they're stable, you would do daily weights, daily urea and electrolytes, just to make sure that they are A, passing urine and losing fluid, and also the frusamide, the large dose of frusamide you might give, is not affecting their uh, renal function going forward. Cool. So uh, let's go through another question. So last 10 seconds, please. 
So let's see what you guys think. So some people have gone for B, 45%, and then some people have gone for C. So what we would do there. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So let's have a look. So uh, you've got a 70-year-old female patient uh, who is um, has metoprolol. Vital signs are temperature is fine. Heart rate is 30, very, very low. Blood pressure is very, very low, 80 over 45. Um, oxygenating, okay, she's got sinus bradycardia. We've given her intravenous atropine and adrenaline. So the answer is actually transcutaneous pacing. I think a lot of you have gone for C as well, which is a reasonable choice actually, C, because in a lot of times, a lot of these guidelines, um, if someone is unstable, you would go straight to cardioversion, DC cardioversion. So I get that. I think this is actually very guidelines based. Um, so it's related to your management of the bradycardia. Um, so the um, observation is probably not the right idea because they look unwell. Permanent pacing is going to be difficult in the first first instance uh, if you need to get loads of things together. So transcutaneous pacing, just putting these sort of uh, these sort of tabs on um, and trying to pace them uh, by putting something on the skin is most better than permanent pacing in the initial stage, of course. Um, and then further bolus of atropine, you've sort of given quite a lot, so probably not the best uh, idea. But let's go through the guidelines because that's the easiest way of sort of framing this. So, so these are the guidelines from the Resuscitation Council, which I would recommend everyone go through for your, uh, for your exams. So you initially what you do is you check if they've got adverse features. And, and basically with the bradycardia, I suppose the difference is, is that you would, um, you, would want to give them, you would want to give them atrophine only if they have adverse features in a way, in the sense that you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't really shock them for bradycardia, basically. That's the sort of point I'm trying to make here, is that yes, you would shock for a lot of things, but it's bradycardia, if they're unstable, we treat with atropine. If that doesn't work, uh, you would then consider more atropine, up to three milligrams, as we saw, or you would consider uh, transcutaneous pacing. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then you know you need to seek expert help and transvenous pacing going forward. And then um, the just looking at the bottom, the um, another alternative which we could have done for this patient actually. If you look at the right at the end, it says glucagon if bradycardia is caused by beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. So this is just one other thing that uh, it can come up in exam. So if someone has like a beta blocker overdose, for example, and they're bradycardic, you can give them glucagon. Um, I'm not really sure actually what the mechanism is, but I remember this is uh, something that uh, is like an exam favorite as well, because it's, it's quite easy to sort of just take it from the guidelines, I suppose. So that's bradycardia in a nutshell, just so you understand the sort of key distinctions, but we'll talk about the other stuff. Um, so the, in Uviva, or if you have an OSCE, for example, they may ask, you know, how would you manage a patient with narrow complex tachycardia? Um, so uh, sometimes uh, you would want to, um, you would want to think to yourself first, you, the first really question is, um, what, how would you distinguish different types? And then what would you do next? So the first question you need to ask is really, is it irregular or is it regular? Because then it differentiates what you would do. And then what you would do next actually depends on this particular question. So always ask yourself, narrow complex tachycardia, is it regular, is it irregular, okay? So this is again from the Resuscitation Council guidelines. So if it's regular, you would give adenosine, so as a rapid bolus, and really this is, <coughs> It, this affects the, the AV node and it tries to essentially stop your heart for a few seconds or milliseconds and it tries to sort of restart it. Um, and then, um, but before you try the adenosine, because it can be quite dangerous, is you try vagal maneuvers. So the vagal maneuvers tend to be something like putting a, a, um, a syringe in someone's mouth and ask them to blow. Again, trying to to, to reactivate that uh, AV node as well. Uh, and then going forward, you'll, um, if that doesn't work, you uh, may need to seek expert help going forward. Um, the most common, to be honest, in, in at least on the medical wards, is that you get patients who have fast atrial fibrillation, that is it's irregular. And on the most part, you would try and rate control them with beta blockers or deltize them if they can't have beta blockers. Um, and the... It's difficult because sometimes people have low blood pressure, so you can't give beta blockers um, because it pushes down your blood pressure. In that case, you may consider something like digoxin. Um, that's the most common that we see on the wards in any case. Um, so regular versus irregular is the most important distinction in narrow complex tachycardia. Um, 
So then the other thing is just if we're on this Viva track, this sort of how would you manage a patient with broad complex tachycardia? And broad complex tachycardia is a bit tricky because um, it can be quite dangerous. So the, the sort of feared one is a bit of ventricular tachycardia, which is a broad complex tachycardia. And that sort of it, it's very much associated with a high risk of arresting basically cardiac arrest. So it, it can be very scary. So broad complex or broad QRS, again, the question is, is it regular or is it irregular? So if it's regular, you would probably assume it to be ventricular tachycardia. And then the treatment for that tends to be amiodarone. Um, so you would sort of give 300 milligram IV and then 900 milligram over 24 hours. And um, if it's irregular, to be honest, a lot of this is very much expert um, related stuff. In some instances, you can have atrial fibrillation with bundle branch block, which is sort of pre-existing. And it's quite difficult because you don't know whether or not it's a ventricular tachycardia or if it's an AF with bundle branch block. And it, it, this can, you do need expert help with this, the cardiology registrar, the consultant to help you out. And um, there are certain ECG criteria that help you distinguish them, which I'm not gonna go through uh, in detail here. Uh, things related, you may have heard of fusion beats, capture beats, but to be honest, I, I myself wouldn't be able to tell you that much about it. But certainly seek expert help if you have someone with an irregular broad QRS complex tachycardia. Um, cool. So. Let's look at the next question. So last 10 seconds, please. So, okay, so uh, let's have a look. So I think people have gone between uh, A and C. So uh, yeah, so A 38% and then C, 26%, cool. So again, this is a hard question and I really don't want you to worry because I, I use a lot of hard questions from our site. So our site has a lot of hard questions, but also some a lot of easier questions. I've used ones because I wanted to illustrate some points and I think that's the ones that people will find helpful because I really want to sort of pinpoint any misconceptions and miscommunications and also help you to sort of think about your own learning. So please don't be too worried if, uh, if you're not getting these right, okay? Because these some of these are quite hard questions, okay? These are not the ones that you would expect in your exams per se, but these are just learning points just in case you get elements of it in your exam. So the answer here is unsynchronized direct current uh, cardioversion. So basically you have someone who essentially has a cardiac arrest. Yeah. And if you have some of the cardiac arrest, the idea really is that you can get, um, it can be related to cardiac um, arrhythmias. So in this particular scenario, you have someone who has an irregular broad complex tachycardia in the context of an arrest. And essentially, you're, if you have an irregular broad complex tachycardia in the context of an arrest, you really, really should be thinking that this should be ventricular fibrillation. That's sort of your, your go-to, you know. Um, and that is a very common cause. Not a common cause, but it is, it is a recognized cause of cardiac arrest. The other things you might see are things like uh, pulseless electrical activity or systole. Um, but this is an important one because then you can actually treat by doing direct current cardioversion, trying to restart the heart. Um, so um, I think the distinctions between A and C were the most the biggest issues. So um, E is incorrect because you there is something to actually defibrillate. So you would try and do something. Uh, adrenaline isn't really the most important thing here because that is mainly in someone who has a PEA or an asystole. So you wouldn't normally give uh, so you'd give adrenaline for that because you can't actually shock anything. And then uh, equally with uh, adrenaline as well and B, again, you, you may give that later on, but you really need to focus first on the cardioversion. And the idea basically is that if you have ventricular fibrillation, 
there's nothing really to synchronize to because you have such a, a sort of irregular sort of uh, something that is not actually causing any proper heartbeat per se. So that's why you would give an unsynchronized direct cardioversion. The synchronized one is actually when you deliver a low energy shock in time with a specific point in the QRS complex. So if someone has a ventricular tachycardia, for example, when you have this sort of regular broad complex tachycardia, then you would want to do a synchronized shock. So I guess the learning point from here is that if you have someone who has an arrest and they have irregular broad complex tachycardia, I want you to assume that it's going to be ventricular fibrillation. Um, and then the next point is about, the, the next learning point is that you should try and shock them if they have a ventricular fibrillation or a tachycardia. And then the last learning point, which is probably a, the, the least important thing I think for your learning, is the differentiation between unsynchronized and synchronized. And I just want you to sort of understand how these single best answer questions can sometimes be quite layered. And therefore, you would uh, you need to know quite a lot to get to the end point. So this is a sort of safe space, as it were, for you to... Uh, uh, learn this stuff in your own time. So I hope that's useful. And here we are, as we were talking about earlier, so this concept of the ALS algorithm, which I really would recommend that you try and learn. Unfortunately, the only way really is to learn it by heart, and then you can also see it um, in the hospital, but in some instances, unfortunately, in our current climate, you're not able to see it as often. So really this sort of non-shockable you would consider giving some adrenaline, for example. Uh, you would uh, try and treat the reversible causes, and then with a shockable um, VF pulses BT, you would try and shock them. I won't go into this in too much detail as it's a cardiology lecture, but what I'll try to do is to get a, uh, I'm, I'm in the process of getting an emergency uh, lecture running, so hopefully that will be very soon. So keep, keep you updated on that. Just a learning point in this scenario. Cool, so we'll move on to the next question. Okay, last 10 seconds, please. Okay, cool. So I think most people have gone for D and then also got B. So there's a differentiation. That's cool. That's cool. So the answer here is intravenous magnesium sulfate. So you've got a 45 year old who has a unipolar depression, takes amtriptyline, lower spirit tract infection. And this, the concept, the key word here of this whole question is polymorphic wide complex tachycardia. So um, there's two ways of sort of figuring out what this is. First is that you've got some of the polymorphic wide complex tachycardia. That's one. But also, he has uh, amtriptyline, which is sort of a well-known cause of a raised or a increased QT, um, increased QT interval. So if someone has a lower speech tract infection, they could have been on a macrolide, for example. So that's the sort of thought process I would have. An amtriptyline and a macrolide, which, both of which can increase the QT, can lead to the syndrome called torsade de point, which is a polymorphic wide complex tachycardia. And the answer is going to be intravenous magnesium sulfate. Um, D is amiodron is for a ventricular tachycardia, but the ventricular tachycardia is like a really regular thing rather than a polymorphic wide complex tachycardia. So I'll just show you an image. Yeah. So basically, you just get loads of. It sort of looks a bit wavy uh, compared to a ventricular tachycardia, but also in, in this particular scenario here, you you just get loads of different looking waves basically and then that's more likely consistent with torsade de point of which the uh, answer is going to be to give magnesium sulfate um, so that is one point one learning point um, other learning point is about long qt syndrome 
which essentially is uh, when you have the QT interval is longer and it can be caused by loads and loads of different things. So it can be related to um, electrolyte abnormalities. So that's why anyone who has a tachycardia or an arrhythmia, you would want to make sure that their electrolytes are in order. It could be related to myocardial ischemia, post cardiac arrest, it also can be congenital. Um, in your medical careers, if you are working as foundation doctors, um, a lot of it is related to drugs, so antipsychotics, tricyclics, SSRIs. And that's really why you do ECGs on anyone who has ever had an overdose. So, and you need to make sure that their QT interval is intact. And anyone who's going to start on antipsychotics, you need to check the QT interval. And that's why everyone checks ECGs a lot in psychiatry um, and then also in people who have overdoses on the acute medical ward. So QT, QT syndrome, uh, long QT syndrome, always check people's electrolytes um, uh, beforehand and in psychiatry, check ECGs uh, before you start anyone on anything and also anyone who has had an overdose. Um, so macrolides in this particular scenario, things like clarithromycin, which our patient could have had, for example. That's a, a, a thing to, to keep in mind. Cool. Uh, let's look at the next question. Right, so last 10 seconds. Right, so most people have gone for B, so that's very good. Um, so 69% gone for B, so that is the correct answer. Cool. So this is a, someone who's been stabbed in the chest and he's got clear. Uh, chest, quiet heart sounds, low blood pressure, high pulse, and a raised JVP. So really what we're thinking is that you have someone with cardiac tamponade um, after being stabbed in the chest, they could have a hemothorax, uh, sorry, a hemopericardium, where they have uh, blood in their heart. And just looking at the, some of these signs, so the pulses alternance is related to left ventricular failure when you have sort of a weak pulse, strong pulse, weak pulse, strong pulse. Um, S3 is related to left ventricular failure. S4 is secondary to a non-compliant left ventricle and that is related to ischemic heart disease and hokum. Slow rising pulse is related to aortic stenosis. So pulses paradoxus is a abnormally large decrease in the stroke volume, systolic blood pressure and pulse during inspiration. So the idea is basically that when you breathe in, you are sort of, um, you, you have a lot of space in your, um, in your chest that is being filled up with something else. So blood or something like that. So when you are breathing in, you, loads of stuff is moving into the chest and therefore it is pushing onto the heart. So when you have loads of stuff in the chest that's pushing on your heart, you have a very large decrease in your stroke volume. So the idea is that you're breathing in, there's lots of stuff in the chest, pushing onto the heart, and you have a low stroke volume, uh, and also a low blood pressure as a result, because you're not getting your cardiac output out um, in the same way you would normally. Um, so cardiac tamponade, um, I actually saw this on the wards last week, where someone just went completely off with very low blood pressure, couldn't even get the pulse, could barely feel the radial pulse. Um, and then you uh, looked at the x-ray, looked a bit like this, and you had this huge heart that looked a bit sort of... Um, globular you could say and this raised jbp you can hear the heart sounds and then what they ended up doing actually was a uh, pericardiocentesis which is essentially putting a very large actually this is quite large i wouldn't, didn't expect it to be that big and um, put the needle in the heart um, or not in the heart but in the pericardium and then trying to get all the fluid out and then that was good fun and the patient got better and then ta -da, the actual heart became less globular and uh, it was uh, the patient was fine. So it's a really nice thing that is quite, uh, the patient was super, super unwell, but actually there was a treatment for it and it was turned out to be a hemo pericardium secondary to taking a um, rivaroxaban, which is uh, a direct oral anticoagulant. So that was very interesting. 
So yeah, so the sort of triad is JBP, heart sounds, muffled heart sounds, and hypotension, also known as Beck's triad for those who have come across it in the past. Cool. Okay, so next question. Right, so that's the last, and so yeah, put your answers in please, if that's all right. Thank you, so five more seconds, if that's okay, thank you. So I've been answering, answering some questions, if I could, cool. So um, someone's just asked, what the anatomical landmarks do you aim for with pericardiosynthesis? To be honest, when I was there the other week, it was the ITU consultant and two cardiology registrars who were messing about with the echo machine and trying to figure out what the landmarks are. So I, I honestly have no idea, um, but certainly it's something extremely specialist, but I'm sure you can read up on it if you're interested. Uh, cool, so the answer here is actually rheumatic fever. Um, and then this idea that, um, so again, this is a hard question and I think people found it difficult. And I, I just wanted to use it as a way of sort of talking about atrial fibrillation. That's a sort of important point for you guys in, in medical school. So you've got someone who has gradually worsening shortness of breath and cough. Um, and then she has a regularly irregular uh, pulse, a tapping apex beat and a mid diastolic murmur best heard over the apex. So um, she's got a regular pulse, so more likely to be atrial fibrillation. Um, and then I think the key reason it's not mitral valve prolapse is because of the murmur. So you'll remember that a mid diastolic murmur is related to a number of things, but mostly sort of um, in this particular scenario is mitral stenosis. So mitral stenosis can cause a mid diastolic murmur, whereas mitral valve prolapse causes a mitral regurgitation. So therefore you would expect a systolic murmur rather than a diastolic murmur. And that's why it's not correct. So basically the sort of connection between all this is that this lady will have had possibly rheumatic fever as a child, uh, and therefore she has this um, this on long standing mitral stenosis, which can present as a tapping apex beats and a mid diastolic murmur, and therefore she has atrial fibrillation. And um, so that's why the answer here is rheumatic fever. But the key thing I really want to mention is this is a just a learning illustrative point. There are many, many more common causes of AF. If someone asks you in a viva, do not say mitral stenosis as the first thing. So let's talk about atrial fibrillation in a bit more detail. So the causes of AF, there are many, many causes. Um, this is a mnemonic that I use as medical students. So uh, pirates, uh, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary disease, post-op, ischemic heart disease, rheumatic disease, anemia, alcohol, age, thyroids, hypertension, sleep apnea, sepsis, surgery, um, which is useful in the sense that if you like mnemonics like I do, but also the, um, what do you call it, uh, the... In practice, the most common cause, to be honest, as a, as a medical doctor or on the wards is things like sepsis, um, things like hypovolemia, um, and things like electrolyte abnormalities. So things like hypokalemia um, and hypocalcemia, hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia. So I would say if I was to say the top three that I've seen in my, in my career so far is probably going to be sepsis. Um, hypovolemia and um, electrolyte abnormalities. But again, if you want to use mnemonics to help you out in the er for early instances, obviously trying to make sense of things, uh, then you can certainly use this as well. Um, and sorry, just before we go that, the, so atrial fibrillation, you on the, you'd see it on the ECG, and normally there is a higher risk of stroke with atrial fibrillation, as you may have come across when I was talking in my neurology lectures, 
Um, and therefore, in someone with atrial fibrillation, you would always want to try and treat them with uh, a blood thinner, such as a warfarin or a direct oral anticoagulant to protect them from stroke going forward. Um, but again, this is just sort of the, the basic stuff about atrial fibrillation, just to, to keep you going um, as part of our whiz through cardiology. Sweet. All right. So what, uh, which clinical sign indicates severe aortic stenosis? So that's the next question. So give you another like um, maybe 15 seconds or so just to All right let's have a look at the answers Cool. So we got 32% talking about uh, C, wide plus pressure, and then lots of people have gone for uh, loud murmur. Fine. So the answer is actually a soft S2. So I really this is an, I think this is an important point to be honest for when you're in your clinical years uh, in terms of the severity of aortic stenosis. Um, so the this is something that sort of is useful in practice but also in exams as examiners like to ask you about it so with aortic stenosis you get this ejection systolic murmur and you sort of hear this um like um this um initial sound and then you hear the second hard sound so it's kind of like pff, 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 pff. that's the sort of thing you would hear and and basically the the more severe it is you the softer the s2 so basically you don't actually hear the pff at the end so it just goes pff. <laughs> Sorry, it sounds weird on, on, on Zoom, I would imagine. Um, but uh, so that's a sign of severity in aortic stenosis. Uh, so the wild, wide blood pressure is actually narrow pulse pressure. Um, chest pain, not necessarily indication of severity of aortic stenosis. Um, reversed S2 rather than reverse S1. And I think the most important learning point here is that loudness is not usually helpful for severity in aortic stenosis. So I think that's a key, key learning point for your clinical examination, but also if it does come up in exams. So uh, knowing what aortic stenosis is. The reason it's important is because it comes up loads in exams and because people like asking questions about it because it's so common. So uh, I think we're I think we've got like a few more questions left. So we'll try and wrap up in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes. Sorry for the, the delay with everything. Cool. Uh, so aortic stenosis, you can get chest pain, shortness of breath, and collapse, ejection, systolic murmur, radiating to the carotids. Um, aortic stenosis radiates to the carotids. Aortic sclerosis, which is also related to this calcification in the in the uh, aortic valve, it doesn't radiate to the carotid. So that's the one distinction clinically between these two sort of similar conditions. Um, slow rising pulse, narrow pulse pressure, and we talked about the soft S2, uh, and also sometimes you can get a fourth heart sound S4, you get hypertrophied ventricles. You would investigate with an echocardiogram, and you can consider treating with aortic valve replacement or a TAVI, which is sort of um, a, a transvenous one where you try and go through the vein and try and open it up um, by a valve there. Uh, and that's something you can do for aortic stenosis, um, but it, it's more of a specialist decision. Cool. Um, just to sort of, as we're talking about valves, just some, some key points, aortic regurgitation. So aortic stenosis, you get an ejection systolic murmur, with the aortic regurgitation, you get an early diastolic murmur. You can get it secondary to endocarditis. You can get it to secondary to dissection. Um, but you can also get it secondary to some rheumatic heart problems, but also connective tissue disease. So things like Marfan syndrome, um, autoimmune disease, such as ankylosing spondylitis, um, spondylosis, sorry. Um, and then with Marfan's, you get this increased arm span, tall stature, upward lens dislocation, a high arch palate. Sometimes you can get patients in your exams that look like Marfan's, and then you may also really want to make sure to look for an early diastolic murmur. But to be completely honest with you, I've only recently started listening to early diastolic murmurs as I was preparing for my PACES exams. So I think don't worry too much if you can't hear it in the early stages, but just know what you're looking for as it can come up in exams.
uh, mitral regurgitation we talked about earlier. So you, you could get this pan-systolic murmur, which we were talking about earlier, um, and it can be related to mitral valve prolapse, which can, people can have long-term, but also can be related to calcification and ischemic heart disease and after myocardial infarctions, but again, can be consistent with some connective tissue diseases. So it's a pan-systolic murmur in mitral regurgitation. Cool, so I think we're almost at our last sort of one or two questions, I think. So we'll uh, move on right towards the end. I'll try and answer questions as we go along. So the last 10 seconds. Okay, so I think, what have we gone for? So we got 22%, 22%. 16% and 30%. So a reasonably even split actually. So that's cool. So fine. So basically you've got someone who has a two week issue of weight loss, fevers and breathlessness. He's got an ejection systolic murmur in the aortic area and he has splinter hemorrhages in his fingers. So the idea here really is that you have someone with probable infective endocarditis. And then the question is what indicates the need for urgent surgery? Okay. So the answer is in fact, increased PR interval on ECG. So I think, I, I think a lot of people went for E, complete absence of lung markings on the right side of the chest x-ray. And I suppose um, perhaps it's important to read the question in the sense that it's asking you what the need for urgent surgery is. So if that E is essentially saying that someone has a, like a pneumothorax, and to be honest, like um, a pneumothorax, the way you treat it is usually by either a needle decompression or chest strain, which I wouldn't say is necessarily urgent surgery because you can do it on the wards. Um, D is blunting of the costophrenic angle on chest x-ray, and that is heart failure, so you wouldn't really do surgery for that. Blood pressure from 90 over 60, um, it's low, but it's not that low, but also if someone has a very low blood pressure, you, they're not really stable enough normally for surgery unless they're super, super unwell. And broad complex tachycardia ECG, we talked about ventricular tachycardia being really, really bad, and therefore someone's got a really bad arrhythmia, you probably wouldn't want to go for urgent surgery. And, and basically C is going to the idea that you have, um, this is like a classic exam question as well, in the sense that if you have increased PR interval on your ECG, that's because you may have an aortic root abscess, um, and therefore you have this, uh, this effect on the PR interval, and, and that is something that you need to sort of monitor in patients who have had uh, infective endocarditis and make sure that if they have an abscess in the aortic root, they need to go for urgent surgery. And the only way to really look at that is to check their PR interval going forward. So um, going through infective endocarditis in a bit more detail, um, in the past, strep V was the most common, but now it's staph aureus, um, as per this paper, which I put down from The Lancet, 2015. Um, but there are many, many other uh, causes. Um, the one that does come up in exams sometimes is strep bovis, and it's people who have infective endocarditis who have colonic lesions, and it's related to sort of seeding of the bacteria within the rest of the heart, within the rest of the body, and goes into the heart. So someone who has previous colorectal cancer who has infective endocarditis, sometimes the answer is like do a colonoscopy or something like that. Uh, but you know, you need to read the question in detail to see actually what they're asking. Um, but yeah, the rest of it is uh, less common. Certainly, staph aureus and then strep viridans. Um, so I think the last few slides now, um, so there are major criteria for infective endocarditis, and a lot of them are related to um, whether or not the microorganisms are consistent with infective endocarditis on positive blood cultures. And you, you probably have come across these criteria. In practice, you need to just do loads of blood cultures. So two blood cultures drawn more than 12 hours apart, um, and uh, you need to make sure that uh, you have 
persistently positive. So you have to have the, the, it present on lots of different blood cultures. And equally in imaging, you want to make sure that the echocardiogram is positive for infective endocarditis, or vegetation, or abscess, or valvular regurgitation. Um, and then the other stuff is a bit more small print. So those are the sort of major criteria. So if you have persistently positive blood cultures and imaging positive, you would say it's much more likely to be uh, endocarditis. But certainly there are minor criteria, which is very important. Um, and then the, uh, and it's interesting that actually predisposition. So if you use intravenous drugs or you have a heart condition, that is a minor criteria. Fever, you can get vascular phenomenon. So these emboli, Janeway lesions, and you can also get immunological phenomenon. So Osler's spot, Osler's nodes, Roth spots in the eye, rheumatoid factors raised. Uh, and then finally, you can have microbiological evidence blood cultures that don't meet major criteria. So you could have sort of a different bacteria, for example, or it could be that it's not persistently positive. And if it's, there's different ways of sort of saying how confident you are of infective myocarditis, and you can say it's sort of two major criteria, for example, or one major and three minor, or all five minor criteria. So that's just a sort of general understanding of how we think about infective endocarditis when we are looking at patients. Um, and the only other thing I would say while we're here is that you can have complications that can be the presenting complaints. So, you know, people can just come in with heart failure and you're not sure why. And it's probably, and it could be infective endocarditis, if you see what I mean. So in certain questions, they may not always say that they have a fever and they have splinter hemorrhages. You know, they could say, oh, someone's coming with a stroke and they're febrile. Why is that? Could be infective endocarditis. Um, they could have infarctions in the kidney, the spleen, or the lung. They could have different infections. So this idea is that you have loads of bacteria running around your whole body. It happens to seed in the heart, but it could be other places. You know, could be in the bone, could be in the joint, um, and um, and that's a sort of thought process I want you to have when you're thinking about infective endocarditis is that it can be a whole body thing. Um, and then we talked about the PR prolongation or complete heart block. So I think that is almost there. Yeah. So one last slide, I think. Uh, so IV antibiotics, uh, it depends on the bugs grown. It depends on which trust you're in as well. Usually it's long term. So people can give sort of pick lines or um, long term antibiotics, essentially IV. Uh, oral doesn't really work for infective endocarditis because the blood is the bacteria is in your blood. And it depends on your local guidelines. If they have a native valve, for example, or a prosthetic valve, or if they have MRSA. But generally speaking, for staff, we give Fluclox. For Streptococcus, we give benzyl penicillin. Um, and also, we could give extra stuff like gentamicin. But I, I don't think you'll be asked much questions about the exact antibiotics. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but just as a general thought process. Um, cool. So thank you very much for coming.